Hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone for actually showing up at 5.30 on a, on a very long day. Hold up. You good? You good? Yeah, it's just me. This is actually my third session this today. So. <laughs> get my hat. <laughs> and I have three more this week. So, so if I get a little punchy at the end of the week, you'll know why. Um, so welcome to uh, this session on Bridging the Gap, Open Staff and VMware Administrators, uh, for Administrator Creators. And we, we're going to try to do things a little differently. Um, we'll talk about that. Um, we're going to take a different approach than we've done in, the, in some of our previous talks, including the one we did last year in Hong Kong. So a uh, couple of quick introductions. So uh, my name is Kenneth Hoy. I'm a technology evangelist over at Rackspace, focused specifically on OpenStack, but also on hybrid cloud, including VMware. Uh, I'm also a uh, V expert for the first time this year. Uh, thank you, uh, Ken. Uh, my name is Scott Lowe. I work for VMware. I'm an engineering architect in the networking and security business unit. Um, and as you can tell by the shirt, that means I work on NSX. And um, the Twitter ID there, in case any of you guys follow me on Twitter. Uh, long time uh, in the VMware space and now spending a lot of time focusing on OpenStack and other open source initiatives um, as my primary focus within, uh, within VMware. All right, I'm going to go over the agenda and kind of kick things off, and then uh, Ken and I will be trading back and forth as we go through the deck. If you do have questions, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to ask those questions anywhere along the way. We do have a Q&A section at the end, so if you want to wait until the end, that's fine. If you want to ask questions in the middle, that's fine too. The only request that we have is that for the purposes of the recording and for those who are going to watch afterwards, let's try and use the mic in the middle. Um, so if you have a question, just, you know, Jump up, run over to the mic. You're not going to offend me or Ken. We're pretty easy going, so there you go. All right, our agenda. First, we want to take uh, a few minutes. We're not going to take a great deal of time. We're going to talk um, the, the phrase here, a tale of two workloads. Talk about why um, uh, or, or how uh, and, and why you might be using VMware with OpenStack and some of the advantages and reasons and business justifications for that. From there, we'll move into a fictitious use case that we have created that we hope you'll find um, both amusing and also useful. And we'll follow that up by looking at a proposed solution of an architecture that actually leverages uh, OpenStack plus a number of VMware products together to build a solution to match the fictitious use case. And we'd like to use the use case as kind of the framework around uh, which we build our discussion on helping people who are not familiar with the OpenStack uh, sort of environment and terminology and uh, operational model um, but who are familiar with uh, VMware's um, kind of traditional virtualization model, uh, help bring them into, into that, uh, that environment. So we're going to use the use case as our framework around which to structure our discussion. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have a Q&A section at the uh, end, but you are welcome to ask questions anywhere along the way. Okay. So we'll start, I'll start by talking a little bit about um, what I like to call a tale of two workloads. So one of the things in any kind of engineer, systems engineering um, truisms, it's this idea that workload dictates architecture, not the other way around. And if you have the work, uh, if you have the wrong architecture, your workload will, will suffer as a result. I got you. So, so I want to talk a little bit about what those two workloads are. One is kind of traditional design workload, traditional workloads that you're used to, if you're, particularly if you're a, 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 a VMware administrator or architect. So this, and these types of workloads tend to be uh, these stateful kind of a uh, monolithic architectures. Think maybe an Oracle server that sits on one server and one server only. If that uh, server runs out of resources, you either need to add more memory, add more disk drives, uh, more resources to that one server, or you have to spin up a second server but do a completely separate instance of the Oracle database. So that your scalability at that, for that kind of infrastructure, it's, uh, it's basically uh, scaling up, not scaling out. And also, if you, again, if you're a VMware administrator, you're very used to this idea that the tools you have are very operator focused, right? For example, how many of you, if you're a VMware administrator, would give your users, your developers, access to the web vSphere web client to set up your own VMs? Probably no one that I've ever heard of. So it's not designed for end users, it's designed for an operator and administrator to use. And because of the nature of that type of application, that it's it's stateful, that it's monolithic. It requires a very resilient infrastructure. Again, think about an Oracle or an Exchange server. Right? One of the reasons you want to put it on a VMware environment is because you want to leverage something like VCA HA. 
so that when the underlying uh, virtu physical server fails, you, you can the application can depend on the VM restarting somewhere else. And as a result, you'll get, sorry, um, you also use a lot of traditionally very um, specialized type of hardware, like the stuff you get from EMC or VC or Net, uh, NetApp, like the VBlock or FlexPy, because you need that um, rock solid infrastructure in order to maintain that type of um, application reliability. And then that second type of workload, the one, so that traditional workload now is probably 90% of the enterprise, but there is that growing 10% um, that you're starting to see pop up that are, uh, tend to be types like mobile apps, uh, web applications, kind of stuff that is, um, used to be the providence of uh, companies like Twitter and Facebook, but now uh, going into the enterprise. So example, I've talked to a number of banks that are talking about creating applications on the web to do all of their bank, uh, banking for their customers and to uh, sell them new products. So those are a different type of application and the design principle for them are very different. So instead of a, think, instead of a one server type of app database, for example, a lot of times you'll have a single database that's spread out across many, many machines. And in, in that environment, um, everything's distributed across so that when there's a failure somewhere else, the assumption is the application will continue running even though it's, nothing's being automatically restarted somewhere else. Um, and also, th these types of applications tend to be very developer focused. So you'll hear a lot in the cloud world about this idea of APIs. So what's the big deal about APIs? The, the idea behind APIs is everything that's in the infrastructure, every service that's available, it's exposed and to the APIs to be used by, the, to be activated by a user. So a developer doesn't need to go through an admin anymore, right? So again, think about a public cloud environment, right, where no, a user doesn't fill out a spreadsheet or an email asking for 10 servers, right? They basically go and spin up 100 servers by themselves, never, having to, never needing to talk to a network admin or a storage admin. So th those are kind of the new next generation applications that uh, even enterprises are starting to uh, develop today. And the design assumption behind those infrastructure, interesting enough in that cloud native environment, is that the, the infrastructure is not at all resilient. The assumption is, in fact, that the infrastructure is going to fail at some point, and that failure is okay. Uh, and the reason, and so what we want to do is, and the reason we that is the case is because when we think about cloud, it, we're really architecting for rapid scale, right? The ability for, again, for example, in a in an environment where you may start with 10 servers and perhaps in a matter of minutes you need to spin up to 200 servers with run applications running them. In that scenario, what you don't want is an infrastructure to hold you back from doing that. You want to be able to move as quickly as possible. We talk, and Jonathan Bright talked about that at the keynote this morning, right? This idea that OpenStax enables you to move fast, fast, and faster. But one of the things that's also true about rapid scale Right, very large environments growing very quickly, is that ca failure is inevitable. Again, if you are a, a VMware administrator, think about you know, having to host thousands and thousands of servers that spin up and down very quickly. At some point, something's not gonna work. The software's gonna fail, servers will fail, the storage that you're relying on to provide, to help provide H8 will fail. So at that point, if you, if you tie yourself to a, resilient, a traditional resilient infrastructure, there is a possibility that you would hit scalability limits much quickly than you would otherwise. And so the key to designing for a cloud environment is you just assume failure. You assume things will fail everywhere at any time and you design around it. So your app, instead of relying on the infrastructure to be 100% bulletproof, you, you design what I would actually call uh, availability uh, in depth, in depth. In other words, you want you want resiliency, yes, at the infrastructure layer at, at some point, but you also mostly you want resiliency at the application layer, so that if anything fails, you can still you still can rely on the application handling and restarting. So a couple of principles around that guidelines then is, again, application handles own resiliency. The, the key to having a uh, a, a rapid scale type of, of cloud is that you need everything to be loosely coupled. So 
for an, an example is you don't want an environment where most or all your servers are connected to the sh same shared storage. Because that shared storage actually becomes a bottleneck for growth. You also don't want an, uh, an architecture where there is a management server that, bottle, that every request has to go through. Because again, that management server or set of management servers becomes your bottleneck. What you want is a loosely coupled message base where, uh, where when you generate requests for resources, those resources get spun up in parallel. Right? So that's, in, in that way, you can spin up thousands and thousands of instances and volumes and, and know that, it um, you, that you won't hit a bottleneck in terms of s scaling up quickly. Uh, the other thing you want to do is to do scale out in that environment, right? Because again, it's much easier. It's you can scale a lot faster by spinning up a, a hundred servers and running your, uh, the instance of your application across them than trying to, uh, trying trying to uh, upgrade one server at a time. So very a lot of small servers is better than one large server, and that kind of gives um, birth to an analogy that some of you have heard of, right? Probably. The idea of cats versus paddle, uh, cattles versus pets. So pets are basically your traditional virtualization environment, right? Where you you know your pets, you know those servers really well. You, you give them your name. When there's a uh, problem, you spend hours maybe fixing that those servers. In a cloud environment, you assume uh, these servers are, are completely disposable. So when you have a VM in a cloud instance that's having problems, you don't worry about fixing it. You just shoot it and rebuild and create another instance, because you can, right, very quickly. Uh, a good example is, uh, is Netflix. So when, when Netflix uh, does upgrades, they don't upgrade their 20,000 VMs at the same time. What they do is they create another 20,000 serve instances, run the new code on it, try it out for a little while, and then they, they kill off the old 20,000 and run everything on the new 20,000. They do that iteratively again and again. So by and the other thing they do is they actually, uh, in their VM, for instance, they, the average life of a VM is 36 hours. And the idea behind that is if you run a server for a very long time, you start getting issues like memory leaks and other kinds of problems. So if you start over, right, you basically start with clean VMs, clean machines on a regular basis. Again, this, that's allow you to handle failure more easily and more quickly. By the way, that cattle versus pets analogy doesn't just apply to VMs. In environments, mm -hmm. it also applies to your host systems, right? Uh, your host hypervisors, where typically you'll have a lot of them, and you will spin them up very, very quickly, add them to uh, your cloud computing infrastructure, and/or remove them, um, all of, typically all in a very automated fashion. Yeah. And then, um, Scott mentioned that we, the way we want to kind of present this vSphere of OpenStack architecture is through a, a sample use case. So, Scott, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna. First, uh, spend just a couple minutes talking about the fictitious use case that we have come up with, and then we'll move from there very quickly into the proposed architecture that we built, and we'll use that to structure the rest of our discussion. So go ahead. All right, so our, our customer here is Acme Corporation, um, and they are in the middle of a business boom because uh, Mr. Wile E. Coyote is a huge customer, so business is booming, no pun intended for those of you that recognize the cartoon character. Um, and in this particular case, we have a customer who um, has a, uh, a vSphere environment. They're running a lot of their, um, their applications on vSphere, as many customers are. And some of those applications would include you know, the kind of traditional uh, stateful uh, applications that are more scale up than scale out. So things like Oracle databases, um, uh, enterprise uh, applications from Microsoft, like messaging, uh, those kinds of things. Their IT department at Acme has recently been tasked with building out an environment for new mobile applications. So they have a, an initiative to build a lot of mobile applications because let's face it, Mr. Coyote is often out in the middle of the desert and doesn't have time to go back to his office and use his regular applications, so he needs to be on the go. And um, so they used to do that with AWS. Uh, they were prototyping applications out there, but they want to bring that in-house now. They feel like there's some value in having that prototyping environment in-house for them, and so they want to bring it in-house, but they want to maintain the, the AWS-like experience, which is probably something all of you have been asked to do at some point. And again, as they mentioned, their, their plan, since most of their applications, or, or a significant number of their applications, are going to move into these um, mobile-type uh, architectures, is to le leverage some cloud-native application architectures, some of the things that uh, Ken mentioned in terms of relying, instead of relying more on scale-up, but instead going to loosely couple systems that are built around a scale-out model. 
So with that um, use case in mind, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the proposed solution that Ken and I came up with for this use case. Okay, so quickly, how many of you, uh, before you came in this room or saw this picture, knows, knew that you can run speech VMware technologies underneath of OpenStack? Good, okay, Excellent, about, that's good news. That's actually good news. So I, obviously there was a perception for a long time that OpenStack and VMware were at odds with each other and could not work together. So um, not only can they work together, but actually there is a, uh, VMware has contributed so enough code into the OpenStack trunk uh, that you can actually run FreeSphere as a hypervisor along with other hypervisors like KVM and Zen underneath of OpenStack. So in the uh, proposed architecture that we would want to uh, give to Acme, basically we want to have a single management plane, right, which would be the OpenStack layer, managing two different work, two different arc infrastructures, one for their traditional applications and one for their uh, next generation web applications. So you look here, th there is uh, on your left, right, there is the uh, KVM app, uh, layer where we're gonna run your, you know, your next gen web applications. Uh, and those uh, are actually separated from a set of compute nodes that are gonna control the vSphere layer. And, and Scott's gonna get into a little more detail about how that works on the vSphere side. Uh, the key thing here for you to note is that there is actually, the way the OpenStack works is you actually need to have, you have different compute nodes running for different hypervisors. So if, let's say Hyper-V was also a, uh, a, a hypervisor that you wanted to run on the OpenStack, you would need a set of dedicated compute nodes for that. In this case, we have a set of dedicated compute nodes that are running KVM as the hypervisor. And then there is a compute node that is talking to a vCenter uh, EXSI cluster um, in order to, and there's a, and Scott will wonder why that's important, why it is that VMware has set it up so that you would uh, want to talk through vCenter as opposed to having the compute nodes talk directly to the EXXI host. But uh, one of the things we'll talk about later is how do you make sure that you place the right workloads in the right environment? Uh, but as you note here that we're running the next gen type apps on KVM, we're gonna run the traditional Oracle Exchange stuff on the vSphere clusters that are being managed by this OpenStack environment. And notice the key, the key kind of, uh, one of the key facts here is that we're placing workloads where the underlying infrastructure is best suited to manage that workload, right? So applications that require resilient infrastructure that um, uh, typical KVM architectures aren't capable of supporting today in, in most cases, um, that's where we put applications that can handle resiliency in the application itself. Applications that assume resilient infrastructure then would run on, on uh, a vSphere hypervisor and the hypervisor can take care of that stuff. All right, so let's um, delve into a little more detail on exactly how this stuff works. Um, so most of you are aware, you know, OpenStack has its compute scheduler that is responsible for looking at requests coming in to schedule workloads and then determining where those workloads should run. And it uh, has a, a database of all of the hypervisors that are available to it and how, many, uh, how much resources each hypervisor has available to it. And so what we've done in this particular case, what VMware did as of the Havana release, continuing forward into Icehouse, is we have a vCenter driver, it's, it's in the trunk, so it's when you download it, you get it, there's nothing extra you have to do. Um, you configure it in NovaConf, and what we do is we present an entire vSphere cluster as a compute node, right? So essentially we're spoofing um, a vSphere cluster as a compute node. Now the benefit of this is, is a couple. One, it allows Nova to take advantage of vSphere without actually having to require any changes upstream in Nova, so very consistent sort of appearance to the higher level uh, Nova scheduler code, it, it just it sees a compute node and it goes on. And we don't have to, to make a bunch of radical changes to that architecture. Second, it allows us to bring features into OpenStack like vSphere HA, like vSphere DRS for dynamic workload balancing, those kinds of things without requiring that OpenStack again be changed or modified in order to support those. So we, we, we kind of hide some of the complexity behind this. Now, one of the very interesting things of how this works is that um, we have this compute node, which is typically a, um, a, a VM, right, uh, running the Nova Compute Services and then configured as such to point back to a vCenter server. Um, one of the popular misconceptions is that the actual number of resources behind this, this kind of spoofed compute node might be inaccurate because, you, you know, out here in the KVM world, you've got, uh, you know, compute node and hypervisor and compute node and hypervisor, compute node and hypervisor, so I can see that. 
The vCenter driver actually knows how many resources are available and all the hypervisors underneath it. So when we've got this vCenter server, if I've got 16 hosts underneath it, what it, the information it reports up to Nova actually is, is the aggregate of those 16 hosts, right? So even though it sees one compute node, it sees that compute node as having the resources that are the aggregate of those 16 hypervisors, right? Question here? <laughs> if you don't mind, yeah, run over there real quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you can, try to remember to use the mic so we get that for the recording. Go ahead, sir. Um, so you mentioned that you have to have a compute node for a cluster. Is that a compute node per cluster or a compute node full stop? There's a couple different ways we can handle that. We can actually do cluster per compute node or we can have a single compute node which will front in multiple clusters. And actually right. in the Ice House release, well actually I think in the Juno release, it will support resource groups, multiple resource groups per yeah. compute node. So resource you're getting pools. more and more granular. Yeah, being able to take a cluster and subdivide it in a resource pool and represent that as a compute node. Um, so we can do it either way. We can, we can have uh, clusters represented as a compute node. We can have multiple clusters represented as a single compute node. Either way, the, VC, uh, the vSphere driver will actually aggregate all of those resources and present that up. So when, when you go into the administration section inside OpenStack, it'll see, you know, 192 gigs of RAM, 144 cores, whatever the number is, right? Um, so that it knows what is actually available, even though it's one compute node and we have 16 hypervisors or 32 hypervisors or whatever is behind it. And so what you see here is, you know, we've got cluster one and cluster two represented as a single Nova compute node. So this is an example of having one Nova compute node front ending two clusters. And then we have another cluster, cluster three, which is represented as another Nova compute node. All of those guys talk to a single vCenter instance or could be configured to talk to multiple vCenter instances so we can aggregate multiple vCenter instances up into uh, an OpenStack compute infrastructure. Then though that vCenter instance or vCenter instances would then manage one or more clusters of uh, uh, ESXi. Uh, for the actual hypervisor support, which then you know would, would leverage a shared data store. That shared data store could be a traditional sort of iSCSI SAN, fiber channel SAN, something like that. Um, it could be NFS data store. It could also be vSAN, which is uh, VMware's uh, scale out um, uh, storage technology that was introduced in 5.5, so that these hypervisors could actually be taking their local storage and aggregating them to create a shared data store that then they would all uh, leverage from there. Um, and then uh, looking at how images work, you know, you're going to still use uh, Glance to pull images out. Those images uh, will be VMDKs, right? Um, and what will happen when you first launched an instance is it will pull the image out of the Glance image store. It will download it into the shared data store. From there, it will actually use linked clones, which is a VMware technology that allows us to clone. It's, think of it something like a QCAL snapshot. Um, so it'll use a linked clone for every subsequent instance that you spin up on that cluster on that data store from that image, right? So the first one might take a couple of minutes to download the image from the Glance um, uh, image service, and then from there it'll just do linked clones, which will be very, very fast, and also very space conservative. Sure. So basically what we're proposing, or we believe the best way to deploy this two infrastructure type environment, is this idea of workload zones. So you want, a, you want the workload that needs a resilient infrastructure, but maybe it's not, doesn't need rapid scale to sit on the vSphere side, and you want the uh, workload that it needs uh, that can tolerate a, a fairly fragile, quote unquote fragile infrastructure, but needs to scale very rapidly, you put that on the other zone. But uh, one of the things that uh, Scott mentions this idea that the, in the vSphere side, the uh, compute node sees the entire cluster as a single resource, right? Which kind of brings up an interesting consideration, which is that there is a, po there is a potential, right? Because the way the, of the way Nova Scheduler works, Nova Scheduler will load balance across available, uh, depending on which uh, compute node at any one time, at the time that you want to launch a resource has the most amount of resources. So you could have a scenario where a, a, a KVM compute node might have eight gigs of memory, and then you have an EXXI cluster with four servers. Each one only have four gigs of memory, but because Nova Scheduler sees that as 16 gigs aggregate, it's going to keep placing load onto that, onto that uh, th that cluster, and also because, again, we're talk we're saying there's two diff there's different types of workloads. You want to be make sure that you don't put your Oracle workload on the KVM side of the house by mistake, uh, or that your MongoDB stuff on the vSphere side. You don't need to. So the way to do that is there are a couple of ways. One is to create this workload zone, or, uh, what we in OpenStack is called an availability zone. So you could create two availability zones. One for vSphere, one for uh, KVM, and then when you launch your instances, you basically have your developers choose the zone 
that matches the uh, hypervisor that they want to place on. Uh, the other way to do it is use something called host aggregates, where you can basically specify that certain nodes have certain capabilities. So one may have an HA capability, while the other doesn't. And then you can use the APIs and you spin up a instance to use the correct host aggregates. So there's different um, advantages and disadvantages using aggregates versus uh, AZs, which I don't, we don't have time to go through. But the key there is there is some configuration that has to be done ahead of time to make sure that the, your application is sitting in the right zone or the right type of uh, compute node environment. So for example, in this here, you see there's an Oracle host aggregate as well as a KVM host aggregate, again, to specify where you want to put a particular workload. So um, Scott's going to talk a little bit. So obviously, it's great to have all these compute instances. But at some point, you need networking <laughs> to make it all work together. So Scott's going to talk about that, how that works in this uh, multi-hypervisor environment. So what we needed here was something to do cross-hypervisor um, networking. Uh, we needed something that would also would connect into VMware vSphere and provide a full set of uh, networking services and network support there, as well as something that would reach into the KVM zone. Um, we wanted to leverage uh, OpenStack Neutron, um, and so VMware NSX provides the cross-hypervisor support that we needed, um, supporting um, a virtual switch on vSphere that allows us to be programmed by the central controllers as well as supporting open vSwitch on KVM, um, which also be uh, programmed uh, by the controllers according to instructions received from uh, OpenStack. And so in this particular case, what we have, um, and, I, and I gave you, I, I, I just picked out a, a, an address here. Anybody know where this address range comes from, by the way? Yeah. This, is, this is an address range, that uh, Class B address range that Microsoft owns. It used to be used in the old Microsoft training books. So if you, if you go back that far enough, right? Um, I used to be a Microsoft certified trainer, so that number is like being brained in my head. Um, but uh, uh, so you know, you, let's just assume that this is the address space you're using and, and it's in your, your environment that Acme is using in this case, right? We have a couple different options for how we can handle this, right? So traditional workloads probably are not gonna be really happy about having some sort of NAT device sitting in the middle between them and all of their clients. So one of the things that we can do in this particular design is we can actually spin up logical networks and those logical networks can be automated uh, you know, via heat templates, they can be automated via API calls, they can be automated through uh, the UI, although manually doing it through the UI isn't really automation, but that's a different story. Um, and we can actually assign them uh, blocks of address space out of the, the so-called public space that belongs to Acme Corporation, right? Now that public space could have just as well been an RFC 1918, you know, 10 net or you know, 172 net or whatever. Um, but we consider that to be publicly routable for that uh, organization. And so then um, those routes can then be propagated into the rest of the network and they appear as just another subnet uh, sitting off the network and then you place all of your hosts. And I, I used a single logical network here with one subnet, but it just, just, just as well could have been a logical network with three different subnets and logical routers in between them and, and all this kind of jazz. I mean, the, the logical topologies that you build can be as complex or as simple as you need them to be. Um, either way, um, NSX uh, coupled with OpenStack Neutron will handle all of that for you. Um, in addition to that, these are kind of your like your production workloads, right? So Oracle, Exchange, um, other types of stateful traditional uh, services. In addition to that, one of the key goals for Acme was bringing in this, this development environment, right, for their developers to do prototyping. And so what we can also do is we can spin up logical networks and, and you know, they're ultimately there are limits, but basically you could have, you know, a, a very large number of um, per developer, developer specific logical networks these logical networks could be exactly identical to each other if they wanted them to be. The example I gave here is that these developer um, logical networks are exactly the same. They're all using 192.168.1 address space. But because they are all isolated and uh, fully separated from one another, uh, that, that's no big deal, right? And so then the developers can use these environments. They can spin them up very, very quickly. They can spin up instances. They can do the prototyping for the applications that they need, um, so on and so forth. And then they can tear them down when they're done. And all of this, again, can be done programmatically through APIs, through heat, uh, templates um, or just you know going through the UI um, for OpenStack Horizon. Um, either way, same system uh, tying into that, all being driven by OpenStack. So you know it's it's all integrated into the rest of it and all coordinated. So as instances are spun up, networks are created and instances are attached. Rules, uh, security profiles, if you have them and want to use them, are automatically applied. So on and so forth. So and one of the things I call out too is if you are familiar in the OpenStack, in the KVM of OpenStack world, using the Open V switch or using the vSphere uh, switch in the vSphere world, uh, 
when you, when, because NSX is acquired, you're actually using it completely, you're not using either of those switches anymore, correct? W right, so there's a, there's a virtual switch in vSphere that is uh, compatible with the NSX controllers. It's programmed by the NSX controllers. Um, it's called the NSX virtual switch or the NSX vSwitch. Um, so that's what's used on, on a vSphere host and then open vSwitch on the KVM hosts, right? And um, these networks are logical networks. They're overlay networks. We could have just as well used bridge networks, which put them, put the, would put the traffic back, up, back out onto essentially provider networks that are managed externally to OpenStack. But in this particular case, because Acme wanted more control over the networking and have that control kind of programmatically and have to go back out to the networking uh, equipment to do that, that's why we uh, use logical overlay networks here. Any so questions before we? Yeah. yeah. Questions? No. Okay. okay. We're clear about storage. So obviously, what as a vSphere customer, one of the things that Acme want to be able to do, right, is be able to leverage new technologies that come up with VMware uh, for their traditional apps because they because they, they have value in them. So one of the things that uh, v, VMware has done that's a little different <laughs> than some of the other hypervisors is so how many of you are familiar with Cinder block storage, right? Great. Okay. So I don't have to explain it, but essentially virtual volumes that you can attach to an instance. So typically that is a volume that's exported out from a server uh, acting as a storage node or from some storage subsystem. And it plugs in almost like a USB drive to a cloud instance that's running on a compute node. What VMware has done, however, that's a little different is they basically enable a VMDK, um, or VMFS to become a Cinder volume. So instead of just exporting directly from a storage array, you actually are working through another layer, the VMDK, VMFS layer. And the main reason for doing that is, uh, as you may know, uh, VMware is getting into software-defined storage. So they're doing things around vSAN, around uh, uh, vVol, which is coming out hopefully this year. <laughs> by using that, by leveraging a VMFS-based Cinder volume, when you attach that to a vSphere, uh, uh, vSphere host that's managed by OpenStack, you actually get all of the uh, capabilities of vSAN or vVol as well. Um, so that's something that's very unique and it's only available currently today to a vSphere host that, uh, EXX host that's attached to OpenStack. Uh, in other words, a KVM host would not be able to, they would use the old traditional way of doing Cinder block storage. So uh, we also want to take some time to talk about some of the, so we talked a lot about the architecture and the technology kind of enabled this pro solution. Uh, but we also want to talk about some of the operational challenges of trying to run these two types of infrastructure under OpenStack. Yeah, and just as a side note, some of these operational challenges are things that we at VMware have addressed, uh, have run into directly. We maintain a, a fairly large OpenStack cloud that has both KVM and vSphere internally that we use for dog fooding our own product as well as for developers, as well as for doing POCs, all that kind of jazz, all kinds of stuff runs on this. Uh, we keep it fairly current, but it does run uh, vSphere 5.5 with vSAN and KVM uh, with Gluster. And so some of these challenges that we talk about here are challenges that we have had to address as well. One of the first of those is the, fans, the fact that because you have two underlying hypervisors and these two underlying hypervisors have basically different sort of disk formats and different expectations for VMs, you need to maintain two different sets of glance images. Right? And so when you go to build a glance image, let's say, oh, okay, Ubuntu 14.04 just came out and I want to be able to make that available as an image to users of my, open, uh, my multi-hypervisor OpenStack cloud, then I need to go create a, uh, a glance image that could be consumed by KVM, typically a QCAL2 disk image that you would create and optimize and then upload into glance. And then I also need to create an Ubuntu 14.04 image, typically a VMDK, that I would then upload into glance to be used by, consumed by vSphere. And the way that this works is that the image, um, and if we were to add another hypervisor, like if we were to add Hyper-V, we would need yet, need yet another image that would be compatible with, with Hyper-V. And you heard Ken talk earlier about the idea of host aggregates. As you create a host aggregate, there's a certain uh, set of metadata that is associated with that host aggregate. That metadata is matched up to a metadata that's associated with the image that helps um, the, uh, the, the system to know when I pick an image, which hypervisor it needs to be scheduled on to run, right? So we would basically associate the images with the host aggregates and therefore when you select an image, it will assume the correct host aggregate and then be scheduled there um, according to the Nova scheduler. You want to take the next one? Yeah, so um, so there's obviously some ch uh, challenges with development testing uh, on KVM. Because you, you, in order to make this work, right, in, rea in the real world, is you want to have your test environment map match your production environment. And so 
uh, one, of things we, one of the things I often hear customers talk about is, hey, how about if I use KVM for my test dev, <laughs> and now I'll use VMware for my production? And the issue with that is, again, some of the stuff with image compatibility, mm -hmm. but also the way the technologies are used, it, it doesn't always work. So uh, you're, you're sort of, again, having to maintain two separate infrastructures, but for, for both your test, your QA, and your dev, and your production environment. And that can add some operational overhead to you. Absolutely. So networking is another challenging area. You do need something that provides that cross hypervisor support. There may be other products out there um, that plug into Neutron. Um, I know there's a number of uh, SDN related vendors in the marketplace. So you, know, you can check and see, and we know that NSX does that. It was designed specifically to do that. Um, we, if you didn't have a solution like this that provides that necessary network virtualization, you would have to draw back something like Nova Network. And, um, and that could be challenging. Um, at that point, um, you know, you're, you're, I don't want to say you're going to fall back, but because of the way Nova Network will interact with vSphere, um, it will basically assume the presence of VLANs. And as soon as you assume the presence of VLANs to start doing any sort of mm -hmm. tenant segmentation, then we start having to bring physical uh, network equipment into the picture, which means as I want to go spin up something new, then I may have to go and you know, configure physical network. Um, which then in turn, just by the nature of what's involved in doing that, kind of slows me down and, and kind of introduces some challenges or some potential concerns when I start looking at a very complex networking environment or a networking environment that maybe is uh, supported by multiple vendors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so using a, a network virtualization solution like NSX allows us to abstract that away. The, the, the control, essentially the control layer then moves up to Neutron, right? And uh, being integrated with the rest of OpenStack allows us to direct the API calls there, and then it handles it uh, from there to, to abstract away differences on a per hypervisor basis, anything of that nature. Now, the last point, um, operational and staff readiness to support multiple hypervisors. You notice I put layer eight. Who's familiar with the layer eight reference? Right? A few of you, right? You have the seven layers of the OSI model, which is the networking, and then layer eight, you have people, <laughs> right? And so this is more of a people problem than a technology problem. Right. Um, and uh, so it's, it's uh, are your people ready to be able to support that? Um, do you, if, if you have a vSphere team, have they been trained in uh, supporting Linux-based hypervisors like KVM? If you are primarily Linux-based org, have they been trained uh, to support vSphere? Yeah, and uh, up to be very honest, right? Ninety, I would say a hundred percent of the time, when someone asks me about, "Hey, can I run vSphere with OpenStack?" is because they have vSphere shop. There aren't that many KVM-only shops that go, "Hey, I want to run VMware tomorrow." So the challenge then is the VMware administrator is the one who often takes responsibility for OpenStack, and it is a challenge. Right now, it is a challenge not to be not to know Linux and not to know some Python and be able to effectively operationalize OpenStack. So that I means traditional VMware admins who never had to deal with that world, you have to learn that world. Yeah. <laughs> and, and keep in mind, I challenge. mean, both, both Ken and I came from, you know, being VMware guys, right? right? Um, so we, we've kind of had to go through the pain of that transition and know that if you aren't familiar with Linux, it's going to be a challenge. If you don't know uh, certain things here and there, it will definitely be a challenge. We have a question here. Yes, sir, go ahead. Talking about operational challenges, how about uh, if a customer has already written you know, some management uh, product, like whether it's portal, catalog, automation on top of VMware. Now, how would you decommission all of that and bring, you know, under OpenStack management? Sure, sir. Uh, so, so, you know, naturally, if you're going to introduce another management layer in, if, they, if you already have tools that have been written to talk directly to the vSphere APIs, um, then, you know, they won't be able to see this KVM infrastructure that you're adding. So you will have to look at retooling to look at the kind of the new architecture that you're building, which has OpenStack spanning both KVM and vSphere. Um, I know that a number of vendors, VMware included, are taking tooling that management tooling that was typically directed just towards vSphere and now adding OpenStack awareness. So earlier today, I gave a, a demo down in the in the, the uh, booth area about showing how tools like VMware Log Insight and VMware vCenter Operations Manager are becoming more OpenStack aware. And I know that other vendors are doing the same thing in terms of kind of retooling their, their, their management and, and operational tools to be able to not address just vSphere, which is kind of the lion's share of what's out there today, but also OpenStack and other solutions yeah. as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think the you know, kind of the larger picture beyond just that portal thing is you are, if you take this on, this dual infrastructure OpenStack, you're effectively now doubling your management point, uh, not just for management, uh, not for just for provisioning, but for management and for uh, monitoring and collecting logs. So, um, I wish I had a better. I wish I had a better solution. I know that uh, vendors like VMware are building out tools that hopefully will be able to aggregate all of that. 
but right now you do have to separate separate monitoring, for example, environment for VMware and a separate monitoring environment for 3DM for Zen. So. Interesting. All right. Uh, we want to end with a summary, and then if people, um, I know we're running into time, so after the summary, if you have any questions, uh, I think Scott and I can be around for a few yep, more minutes, absolutely. and we can, we're happy to answer any questions. So you want to talk about some of the yep, takeaways? Sure. So I, I guess one of the, the key takeaways um, is that OpenStack and VMware are complementary in very, very in, in a number of ways, right? Uh, uh, vSphere as a hypervisor plugs in very nicely under OpenStack uh, Nova. Um, additional tools plugging in to help complement the ecosystem around which uh, is necessary to, for an enterprise to, to put applications in, um, you know, tools like monitoring and logging and, and auditing and those kinds of things, right? Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, ways which there you can go there. The transition for a VMware administrator um, really isn't as, uh, as great as you might, uh, you might think. If you are a VMware administrator looking to make that transition over to OpenStack, um, and you don't have Linux, like learn Linux at the top of your to-do list, uh, I would say put it there um, because you really need to have that, that sort of background. Um, but because they are very complementary, um, there are a number of ways that uh, you can be, help make that transition. I'll talk about a couple of those as we move on. Um, uh, why don't you go ahead and finish? Yeah, so there. again, back to workloads dictates architecture, right? So each of these workloads uh, uh, we're trying to sell, tell, tell you is they have different requirements and you need to pick the right tool, the right infrastructure for the right environment. Uh, one thing I get a lot is people coming to me, customers, potential customers saying, um, can I use OpenStack as a free version of vCloud? And the answer is no. Uh, if you try, if you run OpenStack with KVM or Zen, and you try to run Oracle on it, you will not be, your users will not be happy with the results. And vice versa, there are certain workloads that you, if you want to run it on vSphere, on vCloud, uh, that they may not be happy with the results versus what they could do with OpenStack. So again, it's really important to, uh, you can run both infrastructures together, but you need to run the right workload and the right infrastructure and then tie them together with a common management point. Right, which uh, again, underscoring, just use the right tool for the right job. Um, now, just a few things that aren't listed here, and then we're gonna we're gonna go into Q and A. Yep. Um, and because this is the last session, you know, you guys are welcome to stick around and we'll talk. They're not gonna kick us out or anything. But um, uh, one one key thing to take away: if you are looking at as an as a VMware administrator and you are looking at making that shift, or have been asked to make that shift by your organization, or you're just you're interested and you want to join more, a couple different ways you can do that. One of the easiest ways is to download something called the uh, the VMware OpenStack Virtual Appliance or VOVA. Um, if you just do a Google for VOVA, it's a virtual appliance which you can download, plug in some information, deploy it onto an existing vSphere infrastructure, and then you've got an up and running all in one node of OpenStack that allows you to basically experiment with it, right? It's, it's not a production grade tool, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm not telling you guys go out and deploy your production cloud using VOVA. It's a single virtual appliance, right? But it's great for getting your feet wet, getting used to it, testing the APIs. Uh, testing command line clients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, seeing how it works, getting custom to it. So that's a great, um, a great tool to use. Absolutely free. You can download it, um, deploy it on your existing vSphere infrastructure, and go from there. Ken, um, you know, we should have put a list of URLs up. We didn't. Okay. Yeah, we didn't include that. But Ken has a great series of um, articles on his site, uh, cloudarchitectmusings.com, right? Okay. Yep. Um, and so he goes into, uh, uh, what is it, five or six different series of articles yeah, on, yeah, something like that. Uh, you know, uh, design principles and considerations around deploying vSphere with OpenStack. Lots of great information there, so that would be another place to check. All right, so that means that we're officially out of time and we'll open it up to questions. I, I think we've got time to hang out here, so feel free to come up or hit the mic, whichever works best for you guys. Yeah, mic would be preferable if they're, I don't know if they stopped the recording or not, but yeah. So you talked about the two different glance repositories. Yeah. Where does that image data or image metadata come back together again? So the image metadata, metadata is actually associated with the image itself. Right. Yeah, so there's, like if you were to do a glance image list, you would see the glance image listing right. and then there would be these uh, additional metadata fields that would help tie it to the host aggregate. Okay, so does that get, then I'll have to have two different paths. So if I want to get all, keep all my, you know, information about my images in one spot, I have to come to it so, in two different So Glance ways. is the one place you will do that, and it maintains that metadata and the image stores. But I thought you said yeah. I had to have a, a Glance for VMware. You have to have glance. two images, two, oh, images, two images, one okay. instance of Glance, okay, two images you. stored in. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, no problem. So uh, my question was around, uh, going back to uh, if you have OpenStack at the top layer, right, and then you've got v vSphere sitting underneath it, you can continue to use technologies like SRM to do your DR, whatever you want to do. Is there anything, oh, well, I'm assuming that's the case from my understanding. Mm -hmm. 
is there anything that you can't do? So if we bring OpenStack in on top, because it's going through vCenter, I'm assuming all the traditional VMware admins could continue doing what they do and not even be oblivious that we're using OpenStack on top um, and not have any problems. Is right. That correct? That so, correct so you could, but you generally will want people. So you, you can use the vSphere tools as a as an operator tool, like to you know to troubleshoot, uh, make sure things are working, that kind of stuff. But you wouldn't necessarily want to have them like renaming VMs or uh, migrating them to another cluster or something of that nature because you could be interfering with how OpenStack perceives that to be. Okay. So you're generally going to want to do the majority of your tools that can be done in OpenStack to be done in OpenStack and only those tools that would absolutely be necessary to be done back in on, on the back yeah, end. Yeah, I, I think the biggest issue there is like typically when you do a management orchestration layer, it's you assume that, that management layer has yeah. the single source of truth. That's right. And by kind of going outside of that, you've now, that single source of truth is no longer uh, a single source yeah. of truth. Okay. Now there are some things that you can do. For example, I can do a yeah. vMotion of a VM, yep. or I can put a host in maintenance mode, that kind of thing, hmm. and the, the vSphere driver will know about that, and it will be able to communicate that information up to, up to OpenStack, and that's fine. There are certain things you can't do, right? For example, you can't migrate a VM from one cluster to another cluster when those clusters are separate compute resources, separate Nova compute instances, right? Remember we talked about how a cluster is represented by a Nova compute instance? Yeah, yeah. If I have Nova compute instance one representing cluster one and Nova compute instance two representing cluster two, and I do a vMotion over here, then that will break OpenStack because OpenStack doesn't know that. It doesn't okay. know how to handle is that. that. Is, is, are those lists of possible gotchas documented anywhere? Uh, they may be. If they are, I don't know precisely where. Yeah. We do have an OpenStack community <laughs> okay. on the VMware's communities right. page, and it might be. I, I've documented some of that in my blog post. Okay. Oh yeah, I was going to say. But not yeah, all of them. You should put it in your blog post. Um, <laughs> I have some of them. Yep. I yep. know there's people waiting. There's just, just what you said about um, uh, about moving stuff. So in SRM, for example, if SRM kicked in and started doing a DR recovery, it would be screwed basically, right? It would it would work, but OpenStack wouldn't necessarily know about it. Okay. Let's let's talk offline after. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and and now there is another option if you don't want to do it. If you're concerned about that, is uh, actually to not. Put v VMware on the VC underneath of OpenStack, keep them separate, but then have another a orchestration layer above OpenStack and the vCenter to manage that. So one of the things, uh, one of the things I'm hoping to give a talk on at uh, the coming at VMworld is using VCAC to manage vSphere, OpenStack, public and private, all from one interface. So that would be one yeah. way to. So you could that. you could put another orchestration layer yeah. on top of that to help if if you wanted to do that. So there's a couple of different ways to slice the beast. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, sir. Great, Great job, guys. Um, Thank you. I always enjoy listening to you guys. Uh, my question was actually an extension to what he was saying. Uh, so most of the customers that you go into with VMware uh, already in place, they have thousands of VMs already running and hundreds of applications already out there. What you're addressing here is a greenfield workload. Uh, what about the brownfield? Uh, are we doing anything in that area at all? So there's a couple of different things you can do there, and, and Ken, I want you to weigh in on this as well. Um, some customers have chosen to basically slice off a piece of the infrastructure that would be managed by OpenStack, right? Maybe they'll take a cluster aside and they will give that to OpenStack and see so you have OpenStack consuming one cluster or one portion of a cluster for workloads that will be turned up from the very beginning in OpenStack. That might initiate sort of a, uh, one of these, you know, um, uh, shuffle game uh, migrations, right? Where you spin up the new workload and then you put everything over there and then you decommission the old, that kind of thing until everything's put in there. There is no migration tool that you can run that will just say, suck all these instances out of vSphere and represent them in OpenStack. Um, we've looked at that. What about but in place, in place management of that? At least doing some lifecycle operations through that. Can you be, uh, elaborate say on for that? For example, I have uh, a thousand VMs that are already out there uh, spread across a couple of different clusters. If they are made visible through the OpenStack interface, I could do something with it. At least, right. at least I'll be able to do some lifecycle stuff with it. Yeah. Give me your contact information. I'll pass that to yeah. developers. Like I said, we're looking at that, but we're also looking for customer use cases that make sense where that would be yeah. useful. And to be so honest, catch me afterwards. The, uh, the, on the Nova side, Nova and Glance side, is actually not that difficult to do. It's actually the networking, and only because you're now moving, now you're incorporating NSX. So now it's a migration from vSwitch, <laughs> vSphere distributed switch maybe, to an NSX environment, and obviously that's, there's some work involved in that. The yeah. Nova piece is actually, you're basically just taking a compute node and saying, hey, point it at that vCenter server and manage it, so. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Any, yeah, come on up, that's fine. Uh, uh, this could be a really basic question, uh, but you know, uh, typically it is recommended that our, uh, the way it works is if you have multiple hypervisors, you have different uh, 
controller nodes and then you have an open stack and open stack and, and manage this a whole different uh, hypervisors so uh, typically in the production environments what what complexities does it add when it comes to like you know uh, when you have multiple controller nodes uh, you have to like you know uh, well, you, manage you, you don't need to use uh, you don't usually s you can use the same controller nodes mm -hmm. it's the compute nodes that are different mm -hmm. so you have to have a compute node that manages vcenter that's like sort of proxies and then you have compute nodes that are actually running kvm Okay. But the controller nodes right. are the same for both you, environments. So yeah, you would have, a, a, like in the diagram we showed, we, we had a redundant pair of cloud controllers, um, but those cloud controllers will control all the hypervisors in the environment. Right? So a, a, if we had added Hyper-V to that environment, we would still use the same redundant pair yeah. of cloud controllers to manage that third hypervisor in addition to KVM and vSphere. It's how those hypervisors represent themselves to Nova where we introduce some other, some other differences, like KVM has a Nova compute node running right on it, vCenter is sort of proxied, as Ken mentioned, by a Nova compute node, which may represent one cluster or multiple clusters. Okay, got Does it. Does that help at all? Yep. Okay, thanks. thanks. Yeah, come on up, guys. This is maybe more for comment than a question mm -hmm. per se, but I get the feeling that there's a lot of people who seem to think, well, I could use vSphere or I could use OpenStack, and they kind of do the same thing. Is there any clear criteria around the applications that you want to run? and how you decide which is more suitable and why you would choose one over the other because there seems to be a lot of, to me, just, well, we're gonna try out OpenStack. We're gonna see what it does. Yep. But it's like, no, I've got specific applications I need to yep. run. It, how do I know if it's suitable or not yep. until, do I just try it out? So, uh, yeah. so, yeah, right. so we talked about the sort of beginning of the talk, this idea of is it a, is it a loosely coupled distributed application versus a monolithic kind of stateful application. So, uh, so you kind of, you basically the application and how it handles failure dictates which infrastructure you need. If so the application can handle its own failure uh, properly, then maybe you can set on a cloud. If it relies on the infrastructure you use in, then it needs to probably better su su suited for a free spread type environment. Yeah. Does, does that the, help? the real question or the real thing to remember yeah. though is that vSphere is a, is a hypervisor with a, with a management yeah. solution wrapped around it, right? Um, OpenStack, by default, does not include a hypervisor, right? We have to add KVM to that. So what most people, I think, say when they say, I'm going to go try OpenStack, what yeah. they're really saying is, I'm going to go try Linux and KVM, right. exactly. being orchestrated exactly. by OpenStack, right? That, that part's kind of missing in the puzzle. Right. Yeah. And, and, and what people are talking about. Yeah, and, so I, and that's, that's one of the reasons why Ken and I do these talks, is to help people understand that OpenStack plus vSphere as a hypervisor is a perfectly viable solution, right? Now, in this particular use case that we selected, uh, a disclosure, I work for VMware, right? We could have run the entire infrastructure on, on vSphere. We didn't need to bring KVM in. Now, there's a very specific use case that I want you to share in just a moment, right, where the way vCenter serializes tasks could present a problem for a certain use case, right? But from a hypervisor perspective, you, you could run it all there, right? Um, but there might be other considerations. Maybe, maybe it's a budget consideration. I mean, let's face it, VMware is a commercial product. You have to pay for licensing. Uh, you know, that's, that's, how we, that's how we survive. Um, if, if that is a, a consideration, a design constraint for you, then yeah, maybe KVM is necessary, but you need to go through the, the kind of the, the design process to determine what are the capabilities that KVM provides as a hypervisor that are exposed up through OpenStack as the orchestration layer, what are the capabilities that vSphere provides as a hypervisor that are exposed up through the orchestration stack um, in, in, uh, in the OpenStack to be consumed, right? And then map your applications against that. Uh, the, the broad breakdown that Ken and I have provided is that if you need an application where the, or where the underlying infrastructure can handle failures for you, then you probably need vSphere because none of the other hypervisors on the market typically do that. Yeah, so I just wish they would talk about OpenStack and separately talk about what hypervisor are you going to use. And, and we absolutely so agree. That yeah. option, that it's so, KVM and that this uh, is a whole package. Yeah. Right. But yeah, so 80% of my uh, discussions with customers is all about that. <laughs> what is actually suitable for KVM under OpenStack versus vSphere? Do you guys have, uh, you've talked quite a bit about integration between OpenStack and vSphere level. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations for companies that are using vCloud Director and have a lot um, put into a catalog and <laughs> the vApp concept running vCNS? Right. So, the key word, the operative word here is co-opetition. <laughs> so, 
Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, v yeah. to be frank, vCloud Director competes with OpenStack. The vCloud Director is a is an orchestration tool, um, although it does a little more sort of abstraction things yeah. than I think OpenStack does, which is right. good or bad depending on how you look at it. Um, th there is no sort of hard and fast guidelines. Um, I guess you would need to evaluate those two, again, the same sort of thing, right. evaluate the functionality they provide against the business requirements, determine which one is the right one. Um, you know, make sure that you're clear on VMware's roadmap with regard to vCloud Director and where they're going with it. That's which true too, yep. is another <laughs> story that I'd prefer not to get into. Um, and, and, then, and then make your decision from yeah. there. But they, they are, um, they do serve the same, serve the same right. function in many, in many cases. So if you were looking at something where you want to maintain a vCloud Director type environment, my advice would be then to look at something like Service Mesh or vCloud Automation Center yep. as the layer sitting above right. both OpenStack and vCloud Director and using that as your mm -hmm. management and orchestration layer. Right. And yep. to migrate, say, from one to the other, um, I know NSX is a platform that can be used across all of that. Right. Is it possible to use that to aid in the migration? Uh, potentially, that would be something we'd have to explore in more detail. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. Back again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so glance images, you mentioned that the images have metadata, et cetera, et cetera, right? So let's say, for example, we, in, where I work today in RMS, we have two images, Lin Windows 1 and Linux 1, and then we put everything on top of that. So we would have to create four images, two for Windows mm -hmm. and two for Linux. Yep. But how does, uh, how do, is it like a naming thing? Is it, the, is it something that you can add to the metadata? How does it know that? Is it, was it in the extension? How does it know? So yeah, so part of, if you want the metadata to be represented, um, like there are some cases, uh, I'll give you an example from our internal cloud, right? Um, one of the things that we want to be able to do is run nested hypervisors. Okay. Now you can't run nested hypervisors on KVM. Okay. It just doesn't, doesn't do it, right. right? So we have to, when anytime somebody says um, in the image that I want to run a KVM host, right? then that image metadata, there's only one image for that because the only hypervisor in the physical sense that can do that is vSphere, right? So some of it is, is just saying when somebody says they want to run ESXi, right? Well, we know that has to be scheduled on vSphere because that's the only place you're going to run it. Yeah. Or if somebody says I want to run an Ubuntu KVM host, which is one of the images that I know I have to schedule that over here. Otherwise, you would have to represent in the name of the image uh, for them to distinguish if you want them to distinguish um, which one is which. Um, or you would represent that, you might represent that through um, SLAs like, you know, Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu HA. Okay. All right, something of that nature to, to distinguish, let them distinguish how that, you know, how those are going to be distinguished in terms of which one they're going to select. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, 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 I, I get it. Um, and okay. The other question was around, you mentioned that there's a use case where you... Yes, can we didn't go to that. Yes. You want to cover that one? Yeah, Just so uh, I have a customer who has built... So it used to take them six weeks to give their developers a full stack infrastructure to test on. So they went to VMware, and they weren't virtualized actually. So they went to vSphere with VMC, and they were able to get it to a dam where they could spin up 20 VMs, full stack application install in 15 minutes, right? Pretty good, right? Six weeks, 15 minutes. Then, the, then they went to the lines of business and presented that, and they said, sorry, not good enough. We need, we need you to spin up a couple of hundred VMs we need with application install, we need it done in under five minutes because that's what we're doing in AWS. <laughs> and you want us to come back. Okay. So they actually did some study and they realized they couldn't do that in vSphere. And the main reason is because vCenter has, uh, can only handle eight simultaneous that's requests. Okay. So basically, when you're trying to spin up all these resources, right, you start bottlenecking. Yeah. Plus, the way the hierarchical, I'm, I'm getting a little deep here, but the, the hierarchical in layer, within the way vSphere uh, is architected, you sort of have to build out these pieces, in s some of it in serial. Yeah, yeah. So again, you're bottlenecking there as well. So now they've, they're looking at using OpenStack or KVM or Zen because uh, we don't have, you don't have that, you don't have vCenter actually essentially working as a bottleneck. And plus the way OpenStack works, you're able to build out all these resources kind of in parallel and then use an API to pull them together at the end. We've actually so got the exact use case. Yeah, the, yeah. So the, key, the key limitation there is that um, because we're driving everything through the vCenter server, yeah. vCenter's serialization of tasks ends up being a bottleneck, right? right. Now so again, you get great <laughs> vCenter gives you great functionality yeah. that some of your applications require. So again, it gets yeah. back to right tool for the right, right. place. 
Now you could work around some of that, multiple V centers and that kind of thing, but I mean that's just an architectural decision yeah. to look you at. You don't want to spend all thirty pros and cons and that kind of thing, right? So <laughs> you know, there you go. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello. First, I want to say thank you for this talk. It was very helpful, especially we've been uh, thinking about doing something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, with what, what you presented today, I'm curious: is do you have anything like online um, that talks about this architecture? So what I'm thinking of is being able to present this to uh, you know different people in management so they can understand what this is what the proposed thing is today, mm -hmm. and then my, this the part B of that question is you know what's for the future? It sounds like sounds like this is a, a good first stab at it, but mm -hmm. it, it seems like there's still some uh, you know some warts that need to be kinked out. But, but I, I, I am appreciative of what you guys have done so yep. far. So what's the future, and then is there anything online for what's today? So well, let's just talk about future. Yeah. <laughs> I can't comment on futures necessarily <laughs> per se, product futures, right? I mean, we, we are committed to the code. We are the number four contributor to OpenStack Icehouse um, in terms of the amount of code uh, contributed. Um, so we're obviously committed to, to OpenStack as, as a company. We're gonna continue to develop products. So vSphere enhancements will continue to come. You know, we talked about uh, resource pool support, so being able to subdivide a cluster and have that represented as a compute node. And this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you do things, how you divide up resources and multi-tenancy and that kind of jazz. Um, and so we're, we're constantly you know, exploring more things. Uh, if, if you were in this room prior to Ken and I getting on, one of the guys up here was Gary Cotton, who's one of our developers. He was talking about scheduling options. So obviously, you know, we're deeply involved in, in all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, so more will come, and, and you know, we'll, we'll continue enhancing, continue developing. So just you know, stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, online stuff, there's Ken's um, uh, series, right, of your yeah. number of articles, and then um, these sessions are always recorded. We did one in Hong Kong, right. which is recorded and available online. And uh, then, you know, there's a number of other various yeah, resources, they, they, presentations uh, on it, that kind of thing. To be frank, there isn't a lot out there right now. Um, obviously, there's OpenStack talks um, that will help some. So you have to pull together a lot of things. So, so my suggestion is you email Scott and say, Scott, can you write a book? <laughs> and and, and they, they put the logo up before you can put email up. But yes, you're, you're more than welcome to email me. My, 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 uh, address is uh, slow at vmware.com, so feel free to drop me an email, first initial, last name, at vmware.com, <laughs> and I'd be happy to, to you know, to write a talk book. with you more detail, <laughs> or I don't know about writing a book, but anyway, uh, talk with you more detail if you have anything like that, so, okay. Sorry, last question up for me. All right, uh, I know these guys are eager to get out of here, and the AV <laughs> um, guys, they've been, they've been great. The, control, the compute node for the cluster, the way you've shown it is it's one node, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've got a question, is one, you keep, I keep thinking of it as the physical node, right? And obviously that'd be a waste of resources. So if, you, are you, if you make it a virtual node, Absolutely. Where, where does it sit? Then does it sit on the VMware side? Does it sit on the KVM side? Because it's managing vCenter. And if it fails, are you, what, what do you do? Uh, do you lose your resources or can you just bring up another one and continue from where you left off? As any OpenStack would know that there's another node covering it. So there's a couple different ways to do that. One, one very common design principle on VMware vSphere environments is to have a management cluster. Okay. where resources like vCenter and that kind of thing sit. Yep. So in a large scale environment like this, we would say represent a management cluster. Um, and in that management cluster, we would host on a vSphere HA enabled cluster, the compute nodes that would point to vCenter instances for your other clusters. So right. inception. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of V inception. Right. All right, <laughs> thanks everyone. Feel free to come up and talk informally. Yeah, thanks to the AV guys, appreciate it.